Hello there, and welcome back to the introduction to English linguistics. In this video, I will continue with the topic of sociolinguistics, and specifically, I want to say a few things about language and gender. How do men and women talk differently? As you can imagine, that's not an easy topic to deal with. People have very strong opinions about this, and actually, there's also a whole lot of pseudoscience out there. Yeah, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, that kind of quality research. So, uh, where do we start with language and gender? Let me start with a very basic distinction, namely the distinction between sex and gender. Sex, that's a biological category. Gender, that's a cultural notion. Um, in language, there's both sex-related variability and gender-related variability. Sex-related variability being the differentiation of speech behavior between males and females related to physiological, neurological, and biological factors, and gender-related variability being the differentiation of speech behavior between males and females as it relates to socially constructed gender roles. So you learn how to talk, like for instance, a heterosexual male. Right, when sociolinguists study differences in the speech of men and women, mostly they're concerned with gender-related variability. But nonetheless, let me say a few things about sex-related variability. Um, this chiefly concerns the fact that, statistically speaking, men are a little bit taller than women, and so also their larynxes are larger. Yeah? Uh, this affects the frequency, the pitch with which men and women talk. Men have a fundamental frequency of 80 to 200 hertz, women have a fundamental frequency of 120 to 400 hertz. Now before I started recording this video, I actually prepared a little something for you. Here, this is me saying something. I'll play this to you. Hello there, and welcome back to the introduction to English linguistics. Sounds vaguely familiar, I guess. Um, with this software, I can determine the pitch with which I'm talking, and here, um, okay, uh, I have a fundamental frequency of 108.6 hertz in this passage, and you see that's right within the range of 80 to 200. It's typical male speech. Now, it's been found that in actual language use, speakers exploit and exaggerate physiologically motivated speech differences. So, uh, men have deeper voices by nature, but they actually exaggerate this and talk like this to sound more masculine. So you learn how to talk like a female, like a male. You uh, come to emulate these cultural stereotypes. And this happens very early in life. It's been shown that hearers can actually identify the sex of four-year-old children when they listen to recordings. And this is quite amazing, because at four years, the sizes of the larynxes are no different. Yeah? It's just that these kids have learned how to talk like a boy, how to talk like a girl, and you can pick up on that, you can hear that. Amazing. Now, on to gender-related variability. And I already mentioned this is something that you perform, this is something that you grow into. And I want to read this quote to you. A speaker uses one variant more than another, not because he is male, but because in speaking like that, he is constituting himself as an exemplar of maleness and constituting that variant as an emblem of masculinity. Okay, that sounds quite highbrow, but it denotes something that's actually simple enough, something like the word dude. Yeah, Dude. Who says dude? I mentioned uh, dude in the last video, and here I have some actual data, and um, people who have studied this found that dude is something that happens usually in male-to-male -male conversations. Dude, check this out. Yeah, uh, so it's something that young men say to other young men, and uh, you see females use it a lot less, but when they do, they use it uh, in same-sex conversations to other females. So, um, not only is dude an emblem of masculinity, it's also an emblem of camaraderie. It's not something that you would say to somebody uh, who you're romantically engaged with. Dude, I love you. 
yeah, that's not happening, right? It's, it's do check this out. So, um, emblems of masculinity. Um, let me tell you about a few findings that concern female speakers in English. These have accumulated over the years. Some of these are older than others. Um, but it's been found that women, uh, for instance, make greater use of international contours that are associated with surprise and politeness. Uh, women being more polite, that is a slightly sticky issue that we may need to return to. Uh, women have been found to back channel more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh. Hmm. Um, they have a more diversified vocabulary in certain areas, like color. It's a famous example. Do you know what color mauve is? Yeah, because I don't. If you have a picture of something that's mauve, you can send it my way. Um, women use more tag questions, isn't it? Doesn't it? Uh, they use more discourse markers. Well, actually, you know. And um, more rec a more recent phenomenon is high terminal rise. Let me play you another little something here. Mm. So my next outfit is for like when you're at the beach or the pool. It's very, very casual. It's very, very casual. This is a shirt. It looks kind of big, but it's supposed to be. I got it in a size up so that it would be really slouchy. So over like a... That it would be really slouchy. A bright bikini top, that would be so cute. And then I got just a pair of jean shorts. And then I got some jewelry to go with it just to deck it out. Because it's a very casual outfit, so I would probably pair it with a pair of like really bright flip-flops. And then I got... Really bright flip-flops? This... Um flower bracelet that's kind of chunky and I've that's kind of chunky okay you get the point it's uh, a rising intonation kind of like a question <clears throat> it's not meant to be a question um, it's just a way of talking like an adolescent female right um, so um, these findings have been interpreted in a certain way and one interpretation that we need to talk about is that women tend to use language to build and maintain relationships. This has been called the rapport stuff. You build rapport with somebody, you enter and maintain a relationship, and you nurture that relationship. Um, men, on the other hand, it has been said, they tend to use language in a matter-of-fact kind of way to transmit information to do useful stuff with it and this has been called the report style okay um, these of course are stereotypes that we're dealing with but nonetheless um, there certainly is something to these ideas uh, women and men do use language in different ways and how we interpret that that might be um, a matter for discussion at any rate gender differences in language, we can safely say that they reflect differences in access to power. Yeah? We don't live in an egalitarian society as far as gender is concerned. There are clear advantages to being a male. And this has consequences on the way that people talk. A finding um, of early sociolinguistics was that variability in speech is actually more strongly determined by social class and by gender. yeah. Um, remember the fourth floor study that I talked about in the last video. Class has been seen as a more powerful determinant of how speech varies, but gender certainly is there. And um, well, in these early sociolinguistic studies, gender has been seen as um, yeah, um, second to class, really. Um, so if there is a gender difference, it's been found that women tend to use the form that is more polite, more prestigious, that is more associated with the standard, and more associated with higher social classes. And the interpretation of this was that women are linguistically more status conscious. They're more in tune with who says what. Right, and this again is presumably because in a non-egalitarian society they have fewer non-linguistic means to affirm their status. Another recurrent finding, this time more on the male side of things, is that young men 
use stigmatized forms in order to profit from covert prestige. Yeah, you put young men together and observe how they talk. There's all things going on, like rudeness, playful rudeness, um, use of non-standard language. And this actually happens for a reason. Yeah, this is male camaraderie. This is saying, you and I, we don't need to care about what people think. Yeah, we defy the social pressures that exist in the wider context. We form sort of a cohesive social group. And uh, to exemplify this, let me show you an example, namely the goat vowel in Newcastle. I need to make this large. Um, so this concerns the pronunciation of the O in goat. And uh, you see that <clears throat> one variant of this pronunciation is the um, monophthong O, yeah, goat. Uh, women use goat 100% of the time. So you see this in this graph. We have working class women and middle class women. That's the blue uh, data points here. And both in working class and middle class women are at 100%. Let me play you a little sound clip of how this goat uh, variant sounds. I'm going to make this loud. All right, here we go. Aha! Uh -huh. Immediately we notice a darker color compared to the previous bottling of the 12 year old. And okay, we notice, yeah, and the 12 year old. Uh... And, uh, it does suggest sherry, but how much is caramel is anybody's guess because the bam sticks, these distillers, they just don't tell you on the label. Okay, they don't tell you. Considering what they charge for it, they should. They don't tell you on the label. Um, right, that's that. Um, and you see that uh, the interesting bit happens with the males, yeah? Working class males, middle class males, in old and young. And uh, you see the old middle class males, they pattern like the women. Old working class males, they have a different pattern. Yeah, they use different pronunciations of goat. Um, interestingly now, the young males don't pattern at all like their older peers. Rather, uh, young middle class males, yeah, adolescent middle class males, guys, yeah, they pattern they pattern like the old geezers. Yeah, they use the non-standard dialectal form and uh, young working class males they're actually not as dialectal as the old working class males so rather it's a phenomenon of middle class adolescent males to sort of do re the rebellious thing to use linguistic emblems of being outlaws of being um, yeah um, associated with this working class pattern Young middle class males exaggerate the working class pattern. That's the take home message. So, um, women's tendency to use more standard forms uh, has been found to relate to their wider social network. So, if they're having a greater exposure to different forms, they uh, tend to choose those forms that have more prestige. The strategy here, you might say, is that I model my speech after the most prestigious people I know. If I know very prestigious people, well, I take them. If all I know is the people in my direct network, then, well, uh, I use the most prestigious form that I find there. Let me show you an example again, namely dental stopping, yeah, uh, in which interdentals such as think or that are realized as dentals. Think or that. Um, where does this happen? Well, here we have um, a map of a part of the United States. And so there's New Orleans, there's Houston, and in between um, there's this area in Louisiana. And um, people have studied the percentage of dental stopping in people who live there. And they have investigated the speech of men and women, old, middle, and young. And uh, instead of comparing middle class and working class, they compared close network people with 
open network people, yeah? people who have a very uh, small network of friends, very local, and people who have more open networks through work or travel or whatever. Now, here it's been found that the open-close distinction matters chiefly for women, okay? Um, so if a man has an open network, he doesn't necessarily talk a lot different than um, if he had a closed network of friends. But for women, this difference plays a large role. So open network women use a whole lot less dental stopping. Yeah, They go for the more prestigious interdental think and that. Right. <clears throat> when we talk about social distinctions such as working class, it's clear that these meanings are local. Yeah. So working class doesn't mean the same everywhere across the planet. These are very much encultured notions. So categories such as class, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, they need to be studied in their local context. It doesn't mean the same to be gay yeah, in uh, a place like Indonesia or in a place like Britain. Large differences. So being a woman or being gay mean different things depending on the local community in which a sociolinguistic variable is studied. And um, categorical social distinctions such as chucking up the notion of class into working class, middle class, upper class, that's practical for analysis but it's also problematic because life is rarely as clear-cut as you know working middle upper. So these distinctions cannot be easily transferred across different cultures and different communities. Social categories need to be studied in their local contexts, just as a note of caution. Um, one important idea that I need to present here is the idea of a community of practice. Community of practice, that's a social network of people who engage in a joint activity, such as you know, in a classroom, you know, group of students and a professor, a choir, you know, football fans or scientists in the same discipline. These are communities of practice that share a joint activity. Um, the people in a community of practice develop shared ways of behavior. Yeah? So there are norms for how to behave in a classroom, how to behave in a football stadium, or how to behave as a scientist. Yeah? They share beliefs and values. So even you know hooligans, when they fight with each other, they share the belief that fighting one another is a good thing. Um, so this determines what behaviors are acceptable or desirable. And uh, another ca um, characteristic of communities of practice is there's, there's an internal structure to the community. So as a member of a community, you have a certain standing. Are you an expert at something? Are you a newbie? Are you a member with long-standing experience? Or have you just recently joined the community of practice? I'll explain why this is important to language. But before that, um, let me talk a bit about gender and language change. Now, sociolinguistics is the study of variation in language, but it's also the study of language change. Language variation and language change, those two are very much intertwined. And uh, something that I want to mention here is the gender paradox. So, with sociolinguistic variables, we talked about sociolinguistic variables in the last video. With those that are stable, yeah, not changing, women tend to use the variant that is more oriented towards the standard. So, in a way, women could be seen as more conservative, more standard-oriented. But, with sociolinguistic variables that are currently changing, there women tend to use the progressive new variant, even if it's not a high-prestige variant. Yeah, Think will and Ghana. <clears throat> um, so in phenomena of change, women tend to be the pushers, the ones in the lead, even if the incoming variable has not, um, no, is not associated with the standard, doesn't have the overt prestige 
of the standard. So this is called the gender paradox. And the name behind this, um, well, you've seen Bill Leboff in the last video, but here again, here he is. He came up with two principles that encapsulate this gender paradox. Principle one, for stable sociolinguistic variables, men show a higher frequency of non-standard forms than women. Yeah? And principle two, in change from below, that is change that happens subconsciously, change that speakers are not aware of, women are most often the innovators. The gender paradox, principle one, principle two. So women are leading language change. This has been shown over and over again. It's another robust finding of gender differences in speech. And uh, just three examples that I want to uh, talk about here. One is the quotative marker be like, and I was like, how did that happen? Yeah, Driven by young adolescent females. Uh, certain vowel changes going on in U.S. northern cities, the so-called northern cities shift, so that a phrase such as oh my god is pronounced as oh my god. Yeah, oh my god. <clears throat> Again, women are in the lead. And, um, okay, these are two recent processes from American English, but this has happened also historically, for instance, in late Middle English and Early Modern English, where the pronoun ye was replaced by the pronoun you. Yeah? Again, women were the movers and shakers, and men caught up after a while. Right, um, the last topic that I want to discuss in this video is language and sexual orientation. The question, can you hear if someone is gay? And if so, what features of pronunciation identify a speaker's sexual orientation. All right, again, I, a minute ago I said being gay, that's not the same across different uh, cultures, so we need to see this in its cultural context, namely North America. Can you hear if someone is gay? Right, um, there's previous work on GLB language, yeah, uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual language, and uh, there the converging finding has been that yes, you can tell if someone is gay. So uh, in the first study here, heroes were able to identify the sexual orientation of speakers with more than chance frequency. You give them recordings and they make a guess, and sometimes the guess is right, sometimes it's wrong, but more often than not, it's right. Um, and, um, well, okay, what are the features that uh, make you identify a certain speech sample um, with a certain sexual orientation. Uh, there's been a study that looked at S's, okay? And uh, in a task like this, hearers identified speech samples as gay in which S's had a higher peak frequency and longer duration. Um, in uh, lay discussions, this is sometimes called the gay lisp, yeah? although it's not a lisp. Uh, it's just a very clear pronunciation of S. Yeah, a more careful pronunciation of S than in uh, other ways of speaking. And um, one possible uh, difference between gay and straight male speech, you would think, is pitch. But it has been shown that there is absolutely no difference in vocal pitch between gay men and straight men. So the features must be something else. What are they? What can we say about this? Um, before we return to this question, let me take a step back and ask how could sexual orientation influence speech? You know, how is it uh, that sexual orientation has something to do with speech? Mm. <clears throat> Why would it change the way you talk? Well, here are three the theories that have actually been proposed, um, so let's look at them. Um, theory one would say that there are biological influences on sexual orientation that also affect physical anatomy. Yeah, think of the larynx differences in larynx sizes. So this would mean that okay, it's really a sex-related um, variability. A second theory would state that there are biological influence on uh, sexual orientation that affect maybe not anatomy. Yeah, the way you're body is built, but learning behavior, something cognitive. 
And then the third theory would say that uh, sexual orientation causes attention to peer models of speech, yeah? communities of practice. Um, and uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual speech is acquired purely through culture. So that the people that you hang out with are the people that you model your own speech after. Right. How can we decide between these theories? Well, uh, let's look at theory one in a bit more detail. Um, so, the idea would be that sexual orientation in adults may be the consequence of hormonal exposure in utero. Yeah. So it's something homosexuality would be something that you were born with. Um, and uh, this exposure may cause different physical developmental patterns so that as a baby, as, an, uh, as a fetus, you develop in different ways. So <clears throat> on this theory then, gay men's, speech, uh, gay men's speech apparatus might be more similar to women's and vice versa. So that means that uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual speech should exhibit shifts towards straight female or straight male speech. <clears throat> theory two. Um, here, sexual orientation in adults would also relate to hormonal exposure in utero, um, but instead of causing physiological differences, here the exposure would be thought to cause different trajectories of language acquisition. So, <clears throat> if you're born with um, you know, the, the propensity of being homosexual, you would learn language in a slightly different way, however that would work. Well, so here, lay, lesbian, bisexual, uh, sorry, lesbian, gay, bisexual children may show lesser tendencies to speak like their same-sex peers. Yeah, they might show a lesser aptitude to pick up on these, um, yeah, gender stereotyped ways of talking that heroes can identify already in four-year-olds. And then the third theory uh, would be that all of this is really cultural. So that sexual orientation in adults leads them to seek out same uh, orientation peer groups. <clears throat> you would have communities of practice that develop and share speech patterns. And uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual adults would develop speech patterns that are independent of any biological factors. So lesbian, gay, bisexual speech is not necessarily oriented towards straight female or straight male speech. Yeah, um, You're not trying to emulate something that you are not. Rather, you're doing something that you already are. So, um, how can we evaluate this theory? Um, people have studied this and looked at vowel quality. So, they had a uh, hundred or so people of different genders and uh, sexual orientations. And all speakers were recorded reading a set of sentences, the same sentences. And some of the recorded sentences were played to hearers who could then successfully identify sexual orientation. So in the data, there's information that allows people to pick up on the sexual orientation of these people. All we need to do is identify what these features are. They are in the data. Um, Here's a graph of um, some of the data that was recorded. And uh, this is a vowel chart. <clears throat> and you see uh, ease, is, as, as, and oos. Yeah? So the vowels that you have in beat, bait, bat, bot, and boot. Really, it's bot. Yeah? Bot. bot, bat, bait, beat, boot. And uh, the different colors of the words signify the different pronunciations of the four different groups. Uh, in red, we have heterosexual females. In blue, we have heterosexual males. Yeah, guess how I chose those colors. Uh, in green, we have lesbian, bisexual females. And in gray, we have gay males. Okay, what are the differences? Are there differences? Well, um... <clears throat> So, let's look at this in some detail. Um, a first result is that heterosexual women produce vowels with a higher F1 and F2. So those are frequencies 
um, of the vowels. And uh, it's really no surprise that heterosexual women produce high F1s and F2s when compared to men because, well, their larynxes are smaller and so they produce higher frequencies. Um, right, so far so trivial. Um, now, in two cases here you see that lesbian and bisexual women, the green words, are not completely overlapping with the red words. For beat, bait and bat, they are. No differences there. But for bot and for boot, there are differences. So uh, lesbian and bisexual women produce lower F1 and F2 in back vowels. Okay, why would that be? Are they trying to sound more like males? Is that perhaps it? Wait a minute, let me get a bit more energy. Okay, back again. So, second result, lesbian bisexual women produce lower F1 and F2 in back vowels, not in front vowels. <clears throat> when we look at straight men and gay men, we see that the average formant values, so the values of F1 and F2, are not significantly different. No difference in uh, the overall picture. <clears throat> um, however, we do, do find significant difference with regard to two vowels, namely E and A. Yeah? So the beat pronunciations, they are significantly different, and the bot uh, pronunciations, they are significantly different. Um, what do we make of that? Well, um, here's the, the central result, really. Um, and that would be that gay men have a slightly larger vowel space than heterosexual men. Yeah, so the <clears throat> blue uh, quadrangle here um, shows the vowel space of heterosexual males. The gray uh, vowel space is a little larger. So this might indicate that gay men actually have greater distinctions in the vowels that they pronounce. <clears throat> Results. Uh, there are measurable differences between straight speech and gay, lesbian, bisexual speech, but these differences are inconsistent with the view that gay, lesbian, bisexual speech tries to model straight speech of the opposite sex. So gay speech does not imitate the speech of heterosexual females. You know, they don't have a higher fundamental frequency, higher F1, F2. No, it doesn't happen. And uh, however, Gay speech might copy selected aspects of heterosexual female speech that is being more careful, more pronounced, and therefore it's being perceived as um, you know, taking heterosexual female speech as a model in total. <clears throat> now, these results are inconsistent with the idea that perverted biological reasons of sexual orientation would have anatomical consequences. Yeah, there's no difference in anatomy. This goes right out the window. Um, the results are very much consistent with the idea that gay speech is acquired purely culturally. Yeah, the third theory, that it is communities of practice that as an adult you orient towards the speech of your peers and you model that kind of speech. Now, what about theory two? The idea that there are things going on in the womb and that affects your cognitive behavior later on. Well, this idea is very hard to falsify, so it's perhaps not a very good theory to begin with. We cannot rule it out completely. Um, the results are to some extent compatible with that, that biological reasons of sexual orientation cause differences in learning behavior. However, personally, I don't think it has anything going for it. Right, summing up, <clears throat> I talked about sex-related variability and gender-related variability. Sex-related variability being uh, differentiation on the basis of anatomical differences and gender-related variability really being the meat and potatoes of what sociolinguists are interested in. Performing differences that are based on and that exaggerate sex-related differences and patterns that are learned in communities of practice. 
Another finding that I would like you to remember from this video is that women are typically in the lead of language change. They're more progressive users of language. And lastly, uh, keep in mind that characteristics of lesbian, gay, bisexual speech are unlikely to be the consequence of any biological factors. All right. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.